And I'm thrilled to have Geraldine Horan um, joining us, uh, another London colleague, because a lot of what she does brings together strengths we have been exploring during the lecture series. Uh, Geraldine, if you would move to the second slide, so just to have a um, look back of what we did. And I thought actually the title of a book that Geraldine edited, Doing Politics, Discursivity, Performativity, and Mediation in Political Discourse, could also stand as a subtitle over our whole series of exploring phenomena, linguistic phenomena, from Luther's Zen brief from Dolmetschen, which is an intensely political document, <laughs> um, up to um, today's language of the AfD. And I'm very pleased also that uh, today's lecture links to two previous uh, lectures we have been doing on language purism. And I'm sure we'll discover further cross connections across the series in the course of what Geraldine is going to tell us about. On Zoom. But anyway, let's start again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Henrika, for the invitation to uh, to this lecture series. I'm very, very privileged and it's a great pleasure to be the last contributor to this. Um, and I mean, if I may sort of introduce a, a slight personal note, I believe your predecessor for this course was Chris Wells, if that's correct. Um, and he was my uh, one of my PhD examiners, actually. And um, his work on language in national socialism and language in the post-war German period was very, very influential and very instructive. And I can um, recommend if anyone is interested in pursuing this topic to go back uh, and or to go to his work and, and look at what he's done. Um, it's also lovely to see that um, many of my uh, co-presenters over the last few weeks um, are the same ones that uh, were involved in uh, the volume history uh, landmarks in the history of the German language. Um, and uh, I am tempted to say it's a case of uh, Avengers Assemble, but it's always slightly cringy when uh, an old duffer like me makes popular cultural <laughs> references. So maybe I'll refrain, refrain from that. Plus, you know, we'd, we'd have to get into the whole argument of who's Iron Man and who's Black Widow, and that would possibly get ugly. So um, let's move away now from, from frivolous comments and, and onto this serious topic of uh, totalitarian and nationalist nationalistic language. And I wanted to start off with just a very brief preamble um, on where this fits, this topic fits into a history of the German language. Because if you consult what I would call fairly traditional uh, histories of the German language, you will often find that there is either no or very little mention of um, phenomena such as Nazi language or language use in the GDR. Now, there are very good reasons for that. Uh, the 12 years of Nazi regime, the 40 years of, of um, the, the GDR um, are in language historical terms, perhaps not very long and not very significant, because we can say that the German language was not completely altered during these periods, German continued. Um, so from that perspective, there's not much change to syntax, for example, to grammar, the lexis change, but then of course, lexis always changes. So um, the question is, what do we do with these examples of totalitarian um, and nationalistic language? Um, so I would argue very powerfully that we do need to include this into uh, a history of the German language, not just because we need to look at how the German language was employed and instrumentalized uh, in order to establish and maintain totalitarian uh, states and regimes, but also because it did have a profound effect on the discourse community, uh, on how people uh, reacted, particularly in the post-war period, to the fact that German had been used for such nefarious purposes. Um, and we also need to reflect on, on how we view the relationship between language and politics. Um, because language is a social tool, it's a political tool, so we can't extricate it from um, its use for good and uh, 
nefarious purposes. So to that end, if we if we look at this subject, we need to really draw on a, a, a quite a broad range of theoretical approaches to uh, analysing language and language use, including historical, sociolinguistics and pragmatics. So looking at in these total in a totalitarian regime, what happens to the speech community or the discourse community? How does communication carry on um, on an everyday basis? Again, uh, political language is not just about the language of government or the language of political parties. It really has an influence on everyday life and everyday communication. We also need to draw on um, frameworks from politico linguistics and political discourse analysis. And here we begin to, to see, uh, particularly over the last 30 years or so, a shift towards not just looking at language as a system um, and as a means of communication, but discourse how language is used to create realities, how language is used to create and maintain power relationships and power imbalances. And here we draw on critical discourse analysis uh, and dis, uh, discourse historical analysis or the discourse historical approach. We also need to look at discourse semantics from historical perspective. So how um, words and key expressions um, are based on histories of knowledge. Um, and this also brings in linguistic hermeneutics that yes, new words may be created, words may change their meanings, but they, all, all, um, they always come from an existing archive to sort of slightly misquote Foucault. Um, so we can look at the significance of particular words and phrases and discourses at particular times. So, for example, the, the significance of the word Reich um, is different now to how it would have been in 1912, for example. And then finally, we bring in psycholinguistics and cognitive metaphor analysis. So this idea particularly focuses on metaphor, the influence that particular types of language, uh, particular patterns, uh, the effect that this has on the way in which we process ideas and process the world around us. Um, and this has been particularly effective in analysing um, the, the use of, of Nazi language. So in considering this topic, we need to focus, in, in my view, on three particular aspects. How is the German language used as a political instrument or tool of communication? And in what ways does language, the German language itself, become the subject of totalitarian and nationalist and nationalistic discourses. Um, and as previous contributors have said that, that when we have waves of nationalism, this is accompanied by waves of purism, of concern for the German language and German language becomes reified or verdinglicht, to use that lovely uh, German phrase, it becomes an, an object um, it even becomes anthropomorphized. It becomes a, 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 almost a person and is treated um, as an object that has to be protected um, in some shape or form. Um, and then finally, how do we as German language scholars discuss and assess totalitarian and nationalistic language? To what extent um, is there a boundary between uh, linguistic analysis and Sprachkritik, for example? So um, I'm, I'm not a political scientist, so I, I can't really give you a very authoritative overview of what totalitarianism is. There are many different types of it, um, but I just wanted to highlight a few sort of key points and then link this to language. Um, rather predictably, uh, the, this concept and this term was first coined um, in Italy in 1923 uh, to refer to Mussolini, uh, Mussolini. And, and as you will see on the slide there, um, these are the sort of main features of the, the totalitarian state. Um, I won't go into them in any detail now, but maybe you can uh, look back over the slides and read them in more detail. But if we jump across to totalitarian language, um, there are features such as control of, of public and media discourses, the introduction of new words and expressions to reflect the new structures, organisations, banning or phasing out unsuitable expressions, 
um, changing the meaning of ones that already exist to fit your particular uh, worldview, and then creating through linguistic means in groups and out groups. Uh, and what is of particular importance, I think, for us is this phenomenon of linguistic demonization or dehumanization of the out group. Um, and then euphemisms. Uh, or Tarnsprache, to conceal the unpleasant or the uh, unsuccessful aspects of your regime, and then militarization of language. Um, you may already begin to be thinking of how this links to, uh, to language under national socialism. Um, and as uh, the image shows there on the screen, um, George Orwell's novel, uh, 1984, is often uh, seen as, a, as providing a really uh, perceptive and um, I, I suppose very powerful analysis of or presentation of um, totalitarian language. Now if we map this onto nationalist and nationalistic language that was emerging in the 19th and early 20th centuries in, in Germany, um, Again, here uh, there are some features which we can we can associate with totalitarian language, but here the the emphasis is on um, a, a, the emergence of a radical nationalist view of what it means to be German and what the German the significance of the German language. So it is important to remember that the way in which the National Socialists used language was in many respects not new. Um, it wasn't, uh, the language didn't appear out of nowhere overnight, <clears throat> excuse me, it was based on existing radical nationalist, folkish nationalist um, language. So uh, as is outlined on the slide, there are, um, the, we see the emergence of Begriffsfetische wie Nation, Volkstum, Volksgeiz, Deutschheit, um, the rejection of, of liberal vocabulary, um, the, 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 the real um, promotion in certain circles of racist and anti-Semitic language, which portrays the Jewish population as a threat in the form of uh, a disease um, or some sort of dangerous animal uh, or insect. Uh, and even if we look at um, pupils' essays, as Peter von Paulentz outlines in his history of the German language. In 1914, we begin to see um, that they are, in inverted commas, buying into this discourse. They are beginning to use this language. Um, so words that we recognize from, from Nazi discourse as well, ihre Eisen, heilig hingabe, opferwillig, and siegreich, and so on. Now, um, there has been a lot of research on national socialist language, as you can imagine. Um, but I wanted to look at some of the main features of this language through the lens of Victor Klemperer's uh, book, Reflection on the Language of the Third Reich, Lingua Terti Imperi, um, which was published in 1947, um, but contains his uh, thoughts and thoughts on and reactions to Nazi language. He experienced it himself at first hand. Um, Klemperer was a professor of Romance languages at the Technische Universität in Dresden. Um, he was classified as a so-called non-Aryan, um, as Jewish. And uh, when I talk about, about Nazi language, I often make use of these really annoying air quotes. Um, so I apologise for that. But the, the purpose of these annoying air quotes is to, as a reminder, that such terms as Aryan, non-Aryan are not valid. We should be constantly critical of them. So um, classified as such, he was dismissed from his academic post. Um, he was not placed in a camp um, because he was married to a so-called Aryan, but was effectively on, under house arrest or had his lots of his um, freedoms uh, and rights removed. So his diaries, which you can now um, read on De Greuter, they're available online, um, as well as the, his uh, LTE, uh, provides a really uh, provide a really fascinating reflection of. Uh, Nazi language 
and what he saw as the 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 misuse of it, the degradation of it. Now, while while as linguists we may not agree with um, describing the language in such dramatic terms, what he identified was was very very perceptive and and really gives us a very clear idea of of how language functioned. Um, there's also actually a film uh, which came out in 2004 based on the LTE, La Langue Ne Ment Pas, Language Doesn't Lie. I can thoroughly recommend that. So taking some of his examples um, of uh, language in National Socialism, these are, are some of the ones that he pointed out. So words, keywords such as aria or nicht aria, fanatisch, fanatismus, rasse, folk, many, many creations with folk to emphasize this idea of, of the communal um, enterprise of people um, and that words such as fanatish and fanatismus uh, became very positive. So this was seen as, as, as a quality to be emulated. He also com commented on the use of metaphor and how effective that was, such as everything was kampf, everything was expressed in terms of sieg, whether it referred to battle or war or not. Um, he also pointed out how people were described in terms of mechanizing metaphors or technological metaphors, really signaling that people were just a, a cog in a machine, Gleichschaltung, gleich, people were gleichgeschaltet. Um, then also the, the very powerful use of um, biological or archaic pseudo-mystical words such as art, fremds, also very racist and racialized terms, blut, that, that people were, were judged according to this phenomenon known as blut, um, and also euphemism. So if we remember back to the list of totalitar totalitarian terms or, or language techniques, we can remember that euphemisms are important. They also have a dehumanizing function. So he refers to, to liquidieren, for example. It seems a very technical, very um, unhuman um, term to use, but of course it becomes all the more horrific and dehumanizing because it's applied to humans. And then of course from 1941 onwards we have uh, the emergence of the term Entlösung, final solution, which is also itself uh, a euphemism. Now an another feature of Nazi language um, is Sprachregelung, so the control of language. Um, now, Klemperer doesn't refer to this uh, as such, but I think it is important to, to bring it in um, that the, the, the Nazis kept or attempted to keep a tight control on media and public discourse. And as an example of this, um, we have uh, the, the many, many Presseanweisungen that were issued um, by the Reichsministerium für Volksaufklärung und Propaganda. Um, it is estimated that there were around 80 to 100,000 of these press instructions or press directives that were issued. And this is the example there that's on the screen is of um, the expression Drittes Reich, which of course we associate very closely with the Nazi regime. What is interesting is that um, at some point, the Nazis decided that they didn't like this. Um, one of the reasons uh, being that, of course, if you have a, a first, second and third Reich, then you know, you're just one in a, in a list and there may well be a fourth Reich. Um, so to, to draw attention away from that, they issued these press directives saying, please don't use this. Um, instead, use Großdeutsches Reich or Deutsches Reich. Um, as you will see from just these two examples, their attempts to control language were not always very successful because in uh, up until and be, as far as I know, beyond 1943, they were still issuing the same instruction. Don't use this, please stop using it. Um, so so this idea that that they had a very, very tight and successful control, all, empower, all powerful control of language, I think perhaps needs some investigation because it's, it's uh, 
a little bit uh, more chaotic than it first appears. Now, Victor Klemperer's reactions and ref to and reflections on um, the language of the Third Reich really can be fitted into um, many, many works that appeared in the immediate post-war period uh, that come under the sub or in the genre Sprachkritik. Um, and others included uh, Sternberger Stolz and uh, Stolz und Süßkitz aus dem Wörterbuch des Unmenschen and um, another a series of articles which I can really strongly recommend and I think haven't really been uh, highlighted as much as they could. Um, the philologist Nachman Blumenthal, um, his series of articles in the Yad Vashem studies really I think is a, it gives us a very powerful snapshot of uh, of what was going on in, in post-war Sprachkritik and how um, linguists, language criticizers, um, Sprachkritiker, um, language commentators were, were getting to grips with or were grappling with the phenomenon of Nazi language. Um, and as such, the German language itself, we've talked, I talked a little bit earlier about it being uh, reified or even anthropomorphized. Here we, we have uh, some very clear examples of this. So the German language was um, portrayed as a weapon, um, a, a tool that was used to implement mass murder. Um, it, it was also in, it, to that effect a perpetrator and this is something um, or a co-perpetrator that, that Blumenthal really flags up um, as that uh, part of the quotation I have highlighted, this idea that um, that we should see the Nazi language, as, as he calls it, primarily as one of the most important tools by the Germans, used by the Germans in the physical extermination of the Jewish people. Um, so it's also the case that, that the language was seen as a victim um, Although Blumenthal disputes that, he said, well, you know, it, it shouldn't, our first concern shouldn't be whether the German language was profaned, it should be um, how was the language used, what role did it play in implementing uh, mass murder. Um, so the German language becomes the subject of, of interest. And sort of following up on this idea of, of the language as a victim, um, Adler talks about um how these how the brutalization of the the uh, of the german language and brutalization through the german language will leave as he said in a narbe am sprachleib um a very vivid, vivid metaphor here that the, the body of the language has been injured and that the scars will remain um and of course klemperer mentions this as well. He, he mentions the fact that, um, that language is contaminated or has been contaminated through Nazi use and following the, the Jewish ritual of burying contaminated vessels, he said that perhaps there are certain Nazi words, Nazi expressions that should also be buried forever because uh, because they are contaminating, contaminated and contaminating. Um, now, linguists responded quite critically to Sprachkritik, if that's not too convoluted uh, a phrase. Um, and uh, a lot of these post-war responses were criticised quite heavily for being unlinguistic or non-linguistic. And it, the charge was that there was too much uh, connection between um, political criticism and criticism of the language, that these commentators were using language to as a, as a vehicle to criticise the regime. Um, not, not that there's anything wrong with criticising the regime, but the idea is that, that the language itself shouldn't be subject to aesthetic and moral criticism because it's not the language that is to blame. And, and Ruth Römer, um, I think, uh, expressed this quite, uh, quite succinctly in saying that the problem of talking about the, the misuse of language um, is that it runs the risk of letting um, letting the perpetrators off the hook and not putting the blame where it belongs. 
Ähm, und es ist jetzt die Rede vom Missbrauch der Sprache entlastet auch, ob man das nun will oder nicht, die Anhänger verbrecherische Ideologien. So this idea is that, that we can't let people claim that they were lied to, that they were bewitched by this mag magic language, they were brainwashed. Um, we've actually got to, to, to blame the people that use the language. So perhaps you can talk about the fact that evil deeds were committed with and through language, but we have to take language out of the equation um, as a victim and as a perpetrator. More recent approaches to analyzing um, Nazi language um, have sort of tried to incorporate, I, I, I guess, incorporate aspects of linguistic analysis in the in the truest sense um, or narrow, more narrow sense, and Sprachkritik, and and perhaps taken sort of in some ways gone some way to rehabilitating Klimper as a his works as a valid critical insight into the discourse of the time. Um, so research by uh, colleagues such as, as uh, Bill Dodd uh, and uh, also my research have focused more on discourse communities. How did how was language used on an everyday basis? What was the relationship between the language of the leadership and the language that people used in their everyday lives? Um, and I've looked particularly at this notion of the community of practice, which comes from educational studies and sociolinguistics, um, uh, to see how people participated in uh, Nazi language, um, either as a sort of central participant, if they if they were members of the party and, and engaged in its organisations, or even on a peripheral basis, if they were forced to communicate um, uh, on an everyday basis, as often we are with authorities. Um, so to look at, at instances of participation, um, how people actually co-created the language, they didn't just um, soak it up, they were part of it, um, how they resisted it, um, and how they might have used uh, certain terms and phrases to be part of this uh, national socialist community of practice and how they might have performed to use the sort of uh, Judith Butler uh, post-structuralist feminist uh, notion of performing or identity through language. Um, then other studies uh, have used critical metaphor analysis um, particularly looking at metaphor in Mein Kampf and its cognitive effects um, and in particular at the, the um, effect of that metaphors have in sort of conceptual blending and bringing together various uh, ideas uh, and making links between them in our minds uh, and also um, creating these schema or scenarios. So if you portray the Jewish population as an illness, um, then you set up the scenario of a diagnosis, a treatment, a cure, um, or if you, you place sort of uh, Hitler as, as some sort of uh, godlike figure, then you have, you can set up a scenario through metaphor of crisis followed by redemption. Um, so the, the idea is that this is, um, this highlights the, the, the central importance of metaphor in um, in helping to, to filter our and organize our thoughts. Um, I, in my research, I've looked uh, in particular at the role of women um, in national socialist communities of practice and how women attempted to, to wrestle some degree of agency um, and uh, in participating in, in the so-called national socialist project and in the discourse. So the first quotation is by Gertrud Scholz-Klink, the leader of the NS Frauenschaft from 1934 onwards. There's a picture of her um, on the right looking suitably uh, attired uh, and, uh, for the uh, for the role, um, and she sort of attempts to blend the sort of military language with the language more associated with domesticity. So she talks about wenn auch unsere Waffe auf diesem Gebiet nur der Kochlöffel ist, uh, soll seine Durchschlagskraft nicht geringer sein als die andere Waffe. So the idea is that women fight; they're involved in battle, but but there's is a different battle. Um, but nonetheless, a battle. Um, the other two quotations 
um, highlight how women uh, again were adopted the language for for that for communicative purposes. The first, uh, sorry, the second quotation there is um, a letter by a Kinderreicher Mutter who'd received a gift for her having her four children. Um, she'd received a, a candlestick um, uh, and wrote to the Reichsführer SS to express her, her thanks and gratitude for that using uh, recognizable Nazi language, Alles für den Sieg, der totale Krieg, and so on. And the final example is a denunciation letter, which was sent by a woman uh, who is complaining about her neighbors listening to enemy broadcasts um, and uh, wants to demonstrate, to perform her identity, talking about um, zu unseren Führer halten and, and uh, den Krieg gewinnen. So even on an everyday level, um, in the act of letter writing, for example, people were able to make use of, of this language um, and participate in it. Um, as uh, Falco Falzgraf mentioned uh, last week, um, rather interestingly, the, the Nazis were not language purists per se. Some of them were, but the, the leadership was marked by its complete lack of interest or perhaps even antipathy to language purism. Um, and this, of course, was because uh, it was problematic for the Nazi regime um, to make a link between being German defined in its racist and racialized capacity with the German language, because this would involve um, regarding speakers of German as German when actually you, in, you intended to um, discriminate against them and possibly even murder them. So language wasn't a very helpful uh, symbol of being German um, by uh, according to the Nazis. So that's why I think in many ways they shied away from it. However, this didn't stop women from um, regarding themselves and portraying themselves as guardians of the German language. So earlier on, I mentioned how uh, a lot of women attempted to find their place, so to speak, in, in Nazi <clears throat> activities and Nazi discourse. And one of the course, uh, one of the ways they could do this, of course, was in uh, portraying themselves as mothers of the language and really playing on on this uh, expression Muttersprache. And as this quotation uh, shows, again, I won't read it out, but um, I think it, it shows about how they um, really claim this for themselves and how their role as Trägerinnen um, really also applies to the language. They don't just take care of uh, children, they take care of the, the Muttersprache as well. Um, just very briefly, something on the language of opposition and dissent. So again, it's important to remember that the language was not necessarily as, as monolithic as we might like to think it is. Um, uh, Klemperer talked about um, how he, he was very aware of the monolithic nature of, of Nazi discourse. He said sort of alles schwamm in derselben braunen Soße. And you can see if you look at official language how that might be the case. Um, and how he felt that that was in some ways poisoning um, public discourse. But we do also, we also have examples of oppositional language and dissent. So on the left hand side of the screen, we have um, an example from an, a, a 1933, so obviously still very early on, from actually from a, a um, woman who was a very, considered to herself to be a very active, and loyal National Socialist, but felt that um, the, the party was sidelining women and wrote to Hitler <laughs> to tell him her thoughts. You know, she was very, very cross about, about the roles that women were being prescribed. Um, uh, interestingly, there is a group of women um, that are often referred to as NS feminists, um, which seems a little bit um, contradictory. Um, but there were some, particularly early on, who felt that women should have a level of equality sort of based on Germanic myths of the female warrior and so on. Um, on the right hand side, we have a, uh, a pamphlet by um, 
a group of teenagers known as the Edelweiss Piraten, who were very active in West Germany, particularly in cities such as Cologne and Dusseldorf, uh, who uh, actively campaigned against the Nazis. Um, and here is an example of one of their, their pamphlets um, in which they talk about a life beyond uh, National Socialism, where they're no longer hassled by the Gestapo, for example. Um, these were generally young people between the ages of 14 and 18. Unfortunately, many of them were rounded up and uh, executed. Um, so a very brave uh, display of, of dissent. Now, of course, um, these are tend to be the exception rather than the rule. But still, we do have examples of dissenting discourse. Then we move on to the, the post-war German period. Um, and here it, the situation gets quite interesting, let's put it that way, um, in, because all of a sudden you have a divided Germany. You have two Germanys, so to speak, um, and we, ha we see a, a sudden fragmentation of this close association of the nation state with um, a common language. So that no longer works very well. If you have two Germanys, which Germany uses the, the real German or the correct German? Um, and this led to some quite interesting um, debates and discussions between the two Germanys over the, year, over, uh, over the years over who was the sole representative of the German language. Now, in the post-war period, we can say that uh, there was no sprachliche Stunde Null, as Chris Wells puts it. Language continued. People continued to talk, to write, to communicate. But changes were made to the discourse communities. We have uh, examples of linguistic denazification in the allied zones um, and in, uh, in the Federal Republic of Germany in years after that, a, a fairly um, noticeable Sprachsensibility, to sort of sensitivity to um, German word, uh, to German words that were felt to still have Nazi associations. In the East, in East Germany, in the GDR, we had uh, sort of examples of Sprachkultivierung, cultivation of language, which often involved eliminating elements that were considered fascists. This led to respective insults about which state was the German state and which variety of German. Um, uh, which variety of gem retained fascist elements. So the, the sort of the Nazi insult was traded to and fro, um, also relating to the language. Um, and there were commentators in the Federal Republic that really branded GDR German as um, a, a continuation of uh, Nazi language, uh, a language of totalitarianism, das andere Deutsch, and as the quotation uh, goes there, it, it uh, and I've just noticed another typo, um, it talks about wanting to free the GDR German from the, um, the its speakers from the politische Zwangsjacke. Now, uh, interestingly, Klemperer mentions that um, or he makes a vague reference in his LTE to, to LQI, uh, the Sprache des Vierten Reiches, but doesn't really elaborate on it. So uh, can we say that the GDR used totalitarian language? Um, in some respects, yes. Uh, Patrick Stevenson, in his analysis of it, refers to it as a long de bois, a very wooden language. Um, and some sociolinguists have said that there is an overlap, for example, between Nazi language and GDR language, for example, in the use of folk, words with folk, even though they were used from a different um, political ideological perspective. Von Paulitz uh, takes a slightly different view and says, well, actually, if we're looking at, at continuity, the West German German um, shows greater continuity linguistically um, than East Germany. And if we're comparing language in National Socialism with language in the GDR, actually what we've got in the GDR is very, a very wooden, very formulaic, very dry form of, of uh, political rhetoric, which is miles away 
um, from the very emotionalized, bombastic, as it says on the on the uh, quotation there, vocable music of national socialists. So yes, some elements of totalitarian language in the GDR used by the SED, but not the same in many respects as uh, Nazi language. Then just to, to finish off, since the 1980s, we really see uh, have seen an, an emergence, a re-emergence, depending on how you look at it, of right-wing language. Um, Siegfried Jäger attributes this to um, a political vendor, not the not the vendor uh, in 1989, 1990, but the vendor, the change in coalition from the SDP and FPD, uh, FDP to the CDU and CSU, uh, CSU and F. Gosh. FDP, lots of acronyms in West Germany, and he claims that this really kicked off political developments that that meant that extreme extreme right movements began to 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 become more into focus. And there are a number of right wing parties and organisations, um, such as the NPD, the Deutsche Volksunion, which has now merged, I believe, with the NPD, the Republikaner. More recently, Pegida um, uh, and the Alternative. Für Deutschland, uh, that we're probably all familiar with at the moment. Um, now, of course, the um, any right wing language, it finds itself in a different position uh, if I'm not uh, if I'm not uh, turning language into a thing now. Um, it's 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 not the language of power. It's the language of the periphery. And that means that um, sort of existing in what's often known as a Wehrhafte Demokratie, the Federal Republic of Germany, that is a defensive democracy. People who use right-wing language, particularly extreme right-wing language, have to be very, very careful about how they um, use the language so that they don't fall foul of the Verfassungsschutz. So some, some of it involves almost like a linguistic dance to try and, and evade um, censure. Um, and that involves uh, characteristics as we see here, because the AfD uh, does make use of uh, of right wing populist language. Um, so part of this linguistic dance and manoeuvring involves using mainstream vocabulary in order to position themselves as a as a just justifiably uh, democratic party. Um, then also using vocabulary denoting common sense and reason that they're they're the party of common sense um and that's you know everything is is uh, evidence-based um and very praxis bezogen um they often re-evaluate recontextualize key political terms that you'd recognize in more central left-wing uh discourse gleichberechtigung but but real Gleichberechtigung, not Gleichstellung. Neudeutsche referring to newborn German babies, um, not people who have migrated and have um, to Germany and have assumed German citizenship. Willkommenskultur, again, this idea that the birth rate should, should go up and, and uh, more German, Germans should be encouraged to have babies. This is what they mean by Willkommenskultur and not a culture of welcoming refugees and immigrants. Rather predictably, uh, we see the use of anti-Islamic rhetoric um, and the, the what we call criminalizing xenophobia. So making a connection between criminality um, and immigration. Um, and on a more modern contemporary note, keywords relating to culture wars, Deutsche Leitkultur, uh, you'll be familiar with that term, no doubt, and politische Korrektheit, and really demonizing a lot of these um, discourses about culture wars. Uh, and another feature, as I draw to a close, is uh, their use of or attempts to reintroduce certain elements of Nazi vocabulary, particularly folk. So uh, erstwhile leader of the AfD, um, folk, uh, uh, Frauke Petri, sorry, um, has claimed many times that people should be able to use words such as folk without being um, criticised for it. And this has generated quite a lot of media discourse about the, the re-emergence of Nazi rhetoric. Um, and we see some of the Sprachkritik discourses again, Missbrauch, for example, 
um, and that, about the, the language uh, so this fear that the language is, uh, is back. Um, and rather predictably also um, the AfD uh, takes language again as many as many organizations have nationalist populist organizations parties have and uh, made language part of its its areas of concern uh, seeing uh, German as a marker of identity German should be in in the constitution um, we should or they should oppose Germans should oppose anglicisms and anything politically correct, such as gendering. I think recently uh, Alice Weidel from the AfD has said that the Dudens, um, the Dudens changes to uh, gender uh, or advice on gender examples of gender is Orwellian. And here we have an example of the criticism by the AfD. It's that the Dudens and uh, New Rechtschreibung is nothing more than an Ideologie Hilfe zur Durchsetzung. Linker politik. So again, language becomes the object uh, of debate. So to, to finish off, we can say that the German language was largely unaffected by its use in, in totalitarian and radical national nationalistic contexts, but we do need to bear in mind its lasting effects on German language discourse communities and, and what it really meant for, for German the German language and German society in the post-war period. Um, it is important really to, to understand the link between language, uh, uh, communication and politics and the role of language in disseminating racialized and racist ideologies and how this stigmatizes, dehumanizes others. And for all these reasons, um, political language, including language of totalitarian and nationalism, should play a role and must play a role, uh, a central role in German language history and historiography. So thank you very much. The next two slides are just references, which are, are never very much use if you're giving a presentation. Um, but I hope you can look at those in, in more detail um, at, in your own time. But thank you very much. Many thanks, Geraldine. That was a brilliant and uh, fascinating uh, overview of um, the last uh, century and also really linking up with the themes that we have been discussing, uh, including gender and um, uh, identity and uh, things. I've just put in the chat a link to a petition that um, uh, circulated at the last Bayerische Landtagswahlkampf, where um, position was taken against um, uh, slogans uh, promoted by the AfD, for example, uh, propagating Islamfreie Schulen, which exactly underlines your point of how uh, tropes that were used uh, in anti-Semitic ways during National Socialism are re-emerging as anti-Muslim um, topics. I hand over to Luisa to ask the first question. Thank you very much, and uh, Jardine, thank you very much for this um, presentation, which was really, really interesting. And I have a lot, uh, yeah, I have a lot of questions, but I just stick to one for the moment. Um, and this would be about your uh, methodology, uh, because I was wondering how you, I mean, you, you kind of already mentioned it uh, when you were talking about the air quotes uh, that you've used, um, but I was wondering how do you deal with those totalitarian and violent terms um, in your publications. So how do you um, deal with, um, I mean, in, in a way you're repeating them, so you <coughs> can repeat the, um, the meaning. Um, but on the other hand, of course, it's necessary to, to deal with them and to talk about them. And um, so I was wondering how how are you dealing with this problem in your publications? And also maybe a small follow-up question. Do you think this is those words still have enough power and meaning in the German language that it is really necessary to um, think about if it if you should repeat them? <clears throat> so or keep them alive, kind of. I think that's those are really good questions, and I think they're ones that that anyone who researches this this topic 
continu is continually confronted with. Because on the one hand, it is very important to talk about them in order to explain how they were used, how and for what purposes. Um, and this can only be done through this critical discussion. Um, so I think, of course, we have to be mindful and sensitive to the fact that these were used to in murderous policies. Um, however, we do need to engage with them. So I think in in my research and in my teaching, I you know I try to to frame them as critically as possible, and to uh, constantly make people aware that these are not valid terms, that these are deeply problematic terms, and that we can't we can't use them lightly or glibly, um, and and that we keep we need to keep examining <clears throat> their place in in discourse. Um, so I think. <clears throat> excuse me, not talking about them is not helpful, um, but it has to be done very carefully, I think. Um, I, it's also worth pointing out, as I often do, that, that the words themselves don't do anything. Um, so if you put them away, if you locked them in in a cupboard or if you if they were out in a forest somewhere and nobody spoke them, they wouldn't you know, they, they in themselves, they are not totalitarian or they're not racist or not not uh, uh, um, discriminatory, but they are when they're used or when they're on public view. So again, you have to keep making that connection with the people who use them and the motivation behind them. So I think whilst I think this notion that, that uh, or, or this idea of, of the post-war commentators such as, as Klemperer, while I can see perfectly why they would have really focused on the language and, and seen the language as, as part responsible for what happened, I think we have to be a little bit careful in how we approach that. I mean, that very much is a deterministic view of language, you know, the Sapir-Whorfian hypothesis that, that language influences or controls the way you speak. This idea that if you if you adapt the language, you can make people think certain things. Um, I mean, cognitive metaphor analysis gives us an, a glimpse of how powerful language can be. But I think we constantly have to, to bring it back to the people who are using it and how they're using it. So I think just treading carefully, constantly framing, reframing, critically examining the words. But I think we still need to discuss them. Thank you. Thank you. So, Caroline? Yeah, thank you for this paper. I really learned a lot and it was brilliant. Um, I will come back to one of the topics I discussed with my students in paper four, because in one essay we asked them to reflect on the question whether an S language is a distinct form of the German language. And now I wonder, you, you mentioned the term or you used the term language. Um, what makes it a language and not a variant, a register or a form whatsoever? It's really difficult to address this topic, but while you, you elaborated on this idea, um, you also mentioned that, of course, the opposition, the Edelweiss Piraten or Klempra, naturally don't use NS language. So there must be some kind of other divergent form uh, opposite to the standard, maybe. And also these press releases of the NS um, system, who asked, um, which asked um, the, the citizens to not use certain words, kind of indicate that, that the NS language may not be the standard in public communication. So how do you deal with that? That's a really good question. Uh, and in fact, that was, that has been the subject of discussion since the, the, the uh, post-war period, really. Um, and there was a whole debate between linguists um, over whether you should talk about Sprache des Nationalsozialismus or Sprache im Nationalsozialismus. I think that it's important to state that this was not a recognisable language in the sense of a, a, a variety, a national variety or a local variety, regional variety or anything like that. It was, um, I think, yes, you can talk about perhaps a register, um, or I think this is where discourse comes in quite usefully, really. We can talk about it as a particular uh, form of discourse. 
Um, and we can see this in everyday life. A lot of the, the techniques that they used and strategies that the Nazis used is not that different from what a, a lot of political parties or governments use to try and, and sort of put forward their view and promote themselves and, and uh, denigrate others. Um, but of course, in a totalitarian society, what you do is you remove um, this sort of you remove this what we would call polyphony of discourses so you remove the plurality and you in, you try at least to enforce yours um i mean we can say that there are recognizable nazi words um but that doesn't make it a an actual language in any sense it is very much a particular discourse or range of discourses that were used um, to to govern, to to um, regulate public and private life. So I think, yes, use it. when we say language, we were just using it in a very general loose term to talk about the collection of words and phrases that we associate with this particular party or particular organization. But it didn't it didn't come down in a spaceship and, you know, and, and fry people's brains. Um, you know, that would be a very convenient excuse for why it was so effective. The fact is, from a sort of linguistic hermeneutic perspective, it, it, it history is there to see it drew the nazis drew on existing terms and phrases brought them into the mainstream into the spotlight um and uh, but people carried on communicating you know people went about their everyday business they they shopped they 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 met in organizations they you know they had conversations but under the Nazi regime, of course, the language sort of trickled into all these areas. So there were Nazi recipes. Um, my my father-in-law uh, in in uh, in Germany in Niedersachsen, he went to school. He was a small child during the war. He went to uh, school. His his uh, Schulfibel. I don't know. Falco has done some research on this. Uh, you know, it teaches you to read and write and to form your letters. It also has pictures of the young folk and the young middle um, and gets children to write Heil Hitler. So I think we need to see how these these national socialist discourses found their way into everyday discourses. So language is used in, in the loosest terms here. It's not a set. It's not a, a recognizable language, as we would say German is a language or or even a dialect such as, as Bavarian, for example. This is not what we're talking about. We are talking about a sort of public register, uh, sorry, political register or discourse. Thank you very much. Yeah, many thanks uh, for uh, the the answers, which show that uh, the discussion really has to continue. And I very much uh, hope um, the the lecture series has brought up more questions uh, <laughs> than answered to to continue the series um, next year. Uh, I would um, think um, would love to explore also your other research topic about swearing. I think. Oh yes. <laughs> It's always always a always a pleasure to talk about swearing. <laughs> uh, but also from your lecture today, I, I think um, current discussions of race, for example, what does uh, race in English means that's different from Rasse in German, and how has the term been imbued by meaning? Um, so a lot more to explore. I, I think at this point also all the, the speakers uh, throughout uh, the eight lecture series, it has been the highlight of my term and um, I look forward to continuing the discussion. I stop recording now. <laughs>